I hope you remembered to bring your notes from the last session. Um, were you were you guys here two weeks ago? I was here, here but I. I All right. Know. When Dave Amaral comes, we'll find out if we have an extra set of notes later on. He stores them somewhere. But I think it's page ten, if I recall, in your uh, in your uh, notes that we left off on. Is that correct? Page ten, I think. Yes, we're going to start. We're, we're starting start. on page ten, right? Mm -hmm. at, the, at the top, it's Richard Holden. Yeah. Okay. Page. All right. Now, before we start that, um, I, I have prepared an introduction to this lesson. Now, I didn't have uh, Sylvia reprint the whole thing. So this first part is an introduction that I only have on my sheet right here that we'll put on the internet when we post these, okay? So I'm going to read, I'm going to go through some material here at, by way of introduction, and then we'll get into the stuff that you have in front of you about Holden, okay? So in Lesson 60, we started the survey of the historical development of a clear mid-ex dispensational position, and the chronology, uh, we were in the middle of tracing two weeks ago, significantly challenges the commonly held views uh, as to the historical resurgence of Pauline truth. If you were here, you, you hopefully recall back to Lesson 60 when we were talking about the fact that a lot of this has been done along more institutional terms, uh, where you have a group like, say, the GGF or the Grace Gospel Fellowship or the Brain Bible Fellowship or one of these more organized uh, arms of the so-called Grace Movement. They trace their history back to the founders of the, of the organization or of the movement and not, not past them. So they create the perception that they, these guys sort of just uh, understood this by themselves around, you know, 1930, 1940. I want to read you a couple quotes. Um, these quotes are from the Brain Searchlight. And I think they are very good at sort of highlighting to you what I, what I have and what I'm thinking here, okay? So the first one was written by Pastor Stam, and it's from the uh, January 1988 edition of the Searchlight. He says the following... Later, Mr. John Nelson Darby and Dr. C.I. Schofield were raised up to recover that blessed hope and related truths. The writer well remembers the days when the Darby-Schofield movement had gotten underway. The Darby-Schofield movement. Uh, I don't think so. Because Schofield's not even saved until like 1879. And Darby di dies in the in the, in the early, like eighteen is eighty four what what is it eighty eighty eight so there there is no such thing as a Darby Schofield movement but Sam says there was in the brain searchlight January nineteen eighty eight now I don't the way this is worded is not accurate and is confusing now I don't know if that's what he meant or if he meant to say something about how Schofield's continued what Darby started. I'm not sure exactly what he means, but the way he says this leaves me wondering what he's talking about because it's not very clear. Paul Sadler, the current president of the Brain Bible Society, he, uh, in the 1989 Brain Search Light, May 1989, he says the following. These, the Huguenots, were followed by devout men of God like John Nelson Darby who recovered the truth of the premillennial rapture. Okay. I don't know why he doesn't say pre-tribulation rapture, but he says pre-millennial rapture. Schofield built upon this by uncovering the dispensational approach. Now we've studied enough of the church history to know that did Schofield uncover the dispensational approach? Uh-uh. But that's what he says. So Schofield built upon this by uncovering the dispensational approach to Scripture. Then God raised up Pastor J.C. O'Hare who took a giant step in teaching us how to rightly divide the word of truth. He showed us that there's a difference between prophecy and mystery. Well, then we read, last two weeks ago, we, we read Darby clearly saying that prophecy and mystery are different. I read to you extensive quotations from, uh, from William Trotter's plain papers on prophetic subjects, talking about the fact that he understood the difference between prophecy and mystery. So... My point is that leading leading men, so to speak, in the in the so-called grace movement, have made we they made statements that when you really trace the history, I, they clearly don't they clearly have not done the type of studies that we've been involved in here, 
or there's no way they would have made statements like this. Okay? So again, it's sort of curious as to what's really going on here. So he says that O'Hare took a giant step in teaching us how to rightly divide the word of truth. He showed us that there's a difference between prophecy and mystery. He was followed by pastors Stan, Baker, Ellison, and others who, who uh, were used of the Lord to bring order out of chaos. Pastor Stan was largely responsible for systematically putting the message together and working out many of the problem areas. I just, I just got a problem with these statements because they're not historically accurate. And it shows you, in my, the reason I'm sharing them with you, because it shows you the, the, the true lack of really historical understanding that, that, that has existed in our so-called group or movement for a very long time. The Huguenots, this is now from a different, this is from the January 91 edition of the Searchlight Now. This is Sadler again. He says, The Huguenots were followed by devout men of God like Darby, who, as we have said, recovered the truth of the pre tribulation rapture. Okay? See, I still feel built upon this, uncovering the dispensational approach to scriptures. Later, God raised up Pastor O'Hare and took a giant step in teaching us how to rightly divide the word of truth. He was instrumental in showing the church the great <coughs> distinction between prophecy and mystery. Now, I don't dispute the fact that O'Hare was a big player in popularizing that understanding, but he's definitely not the, the first one to, to you know, uncover it or whatever term you want to use for it. So, not, there's, there's things that have been said here, and it shows just really the, the lack of understanding of the history of these things. And i I got to be honest with you that until I started this, I would have readily repeated any of this stuff that I read in the searchlight by Stam or Sadler as if, you know, they knew what they were talking about, taking it for granted that they did. And now that, you know, we've done what we've done in this class, I realize how totally un unaware, largely, the, that folks are about the real history of the uncovery of, of, dis of Pauline dispensational truth. So, not only as much of the information in the statements above quoted historically false, it is, uh, <laughs> it is indicative of an institutional approach to church history we discussed in Lesson 60. It is the contention of the Grace History Project, that's what we're doing right now, that significant advancements in the resurgence of Pauline truth were made by generations immediately following Darby. In fact, these advancements were such that it can be proven that the major tenets of a mid acts position can be observed in print by 1870 and for sure by 1900. This massive resurgence in mid acts Pauline dispensationalism is best understood by observing the process of generational refinement. For example, Darby articulated many of the fundamental viewpoints utilized by the mid acts position, and building upon the shoulders of Darby's work, subsequent generations were able to restore major elements of the mid acts position. This lesson is a second step in uncovering this exciting, rewarding, edifying, and overlooked history. The simplest way to trace the historical development of mid acts Pauline dispensationalism is to consider the emerging understanding of the mystery. And that's what we started doing two weeks ago. We started tracing how the mystery was understood in uh, Romans 16, Ephesians 3, and Colossians 1. And once the mystery was understood as a unique Pauline revelation, it was only a matter of time before the Acts 2 position was no longer sustainable for those striving for doctrinal consistency. Now, here's what we looked at so far, okay? Two weeks ago, the first document we looked at was the American Study Bible of the New Testament of, of, uh, published by Edward C Edmund Cushing in 1828. We looked at the statement in there about the mystery. Then from there, the second document we looked at was Darby's The Rapture of the Saints and the Character of the Jewish Remnant. Alright? Now, this, unfortunately, this is not dated. Okay? Uh, but it, it would, it would, the majority of Darby's writing falls somewhere between 1830 and about 1845. Okay? But unfortunately, he doesn't date it. Now, we also looked at William Trotter. We looked at William Trotter's uh, 
Christ and the church. And that is, that is uh, essay number five in his plain papers. Now, I said to you, I, here's what's happened since last time we, we, uh, we talked. I said to you originally that this falls somewhere between 1815 and 1855, and we said that based on docu documented statements about when the second edition was, was published. Well, since... Since I uh, taught you that, I have ordered. I ordered a copy, a reprinted copy of, of Trotter's Plain Papers. I had been using just the uh, stuff that was available on the internet. Uh, all, this entire document, Plain Papers, is all available for free on the internet. But I, that wasn't good enough, so I had to. I had to order one. Okay. So there's a there's a preface in here that was that was in the second edition. So this is a reprint of Trotter's preface. To the second edition of Plain Papers. Okay? And there's a statement here that says, Upward of ten years have elapsed since the first edition began. So he says right in the preface that he printed the first edition how long? Ten years ago. Ten years ago. Okay? If you go to the second chapter in this, there's an explanatory footnote at the bottom which says the following. The above was written in January 1853. Okay? So if he tells you in the preface that the first edition was written ten years before, and there's a footnote explaining it that, that, that what he was talking about was written in 1853, because he's talking about something very specific that happened historically, and when it happened, then I know that this is more accurately, look, we should more accurately look at this between 1850 and 181. 53. 53. So what we've done is we've narrowed the historical window for this document with by, by two years. Okay? So between 1850 and 1853, Trotter writes that document which we talked about last Sunday. Alright? Now, in this lesson, I want to consider the remarkable work of William or uh, Richard Holden and prove... I'm not talking about the actor, by the way, okay? And prove the Minax position was known and in print by 1870, some 60 to 70 years before the time of J.C. O'Hare. Okay? So, Richard Holden is the next guy up. He writes, his book is called, and it's a very long, the original title is very long. It's called The Mystery... Uh, the special, this is the title of the book, The Special Mission of the Apostle Paul The Key to the Present Dispensation. And this dates from 1870. Okay? Now just look at the title. Do you suppose this guy understood some things? Okay, that's, that's what he called it. So let's look at this. Point number one. In 1870, a member of the Plymouth Brother named Richard Holden published the mystery, the special, the special mission of the Apostle Paul, the key to understanding the present dispensation. Now you notice I have two citations there. Okay, Stuart Allen says... That this was written in 1870, page 47 of his book, and Michael Penny says this also. Now, the work was anonymously republished, though, in the Brethren magazine, The Christian's Friend, in 1876, with the following abbreviated title, The Mystery, Ephesians 3. An analysis of this book shows clear progression and refinement in the resurgence of Pauline truth making it possibly the earliest known articulation of the mid acts dispensational position. Now again, Mike uh, turned me on to this particular document last summer when he handed it to me and I photocopied and read it. I have also subsequently bought a, a, a copy of this from uh, Bible Truth Publishers that has a copy of this document, a reprinted copy of this document also. I have also found a digitized copy of the 1876 edition of The Christian's Friend on the internet and it is, it is showing up there word for word 
just like it does in the documentation that I was provided. So what happened is, Holden writes this book in 1870. Uh, I've got two sources that prove this out, that bear this out. Stuart Allen and Michael Penny both say this report the same thing. And then it was reprinted anonymously in the Christian Friend magazine in, eight, in 1876 with no name on it as, as far as an author with an abbreviated title. Okay, So this long title here is shortened in the Christian Friend in 1876 to simply say Ephesians 3, I'm sorry, the mystery, Ephesians 3. Okay? So this is this is in existence now for dating from 1870. Now let's look at let's analyze what, what he says, okay? From the opening paragraphs, the reader is presented with a mature understanding of the unique commission of the Apostle Paul. Holden writes the following. There were two there were two objects embraced in Paul's ministry. He was uh, he has expressed them in verse 8 and 9, Ephesians 3 of this chapter where he states in brief in, in plain terms the character of his commission as an apostle or evangelizer. First, the grace was bestowed upon him of his being sent to preach among the nation, and I think there's a typo there, I think it should say nations, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Uh, let me tell you, here's the thing that happened when I was doing this. At first I was forced to type all this myself, but then I found the digitized copy of the Christian's friend, and then I was able to cut and paste it about halfway through. So there's probably some typos in the first little bit here. Okay, now look at the look at the next paragraph though. The emphasis here is on the fact of the Gentiles being those to whom he was especially commissioned. A richer and fuller exhibition of these unsearchable riches there certainly was in Paul's ministry, but otherwise the specialty of the grace given unto him lay in in his being selected to preach them among the Gentiles. The second branch of the Apostles' Commission was that, uh, was that expressed in the words to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. There is here, I apprehend, and intend a contrast between all of the Gentiles of the preceding verse. Jew and Gentile were alike indebted to Paul's ministry for the knowledge and intelligence of a mystery unveiled through him, which he was specially commissioned to make all men see. So what's he saying there? Why don't you turn to Ephesians 3 if you, if you... He's saying that the unique message and ministry of the Apostle Paul was number one, that he was sent to who? Gentiles. Gentiles. And number two, that he that to, to Paul was, was revealed this information regarding the mystery. Okay? So just, just kind of have Ephesians 3 open because we'll be probably making reference to a few things here as we go through this. All right? Next point. According to Holden, the vast majority of Christians are ignorant of Paul's commission, and the Reformers said nothing about it, thereby leaving it for later generations to exhume. All right? To many it will seem a bold or even a rash assertion that to the vast majority of Christians, learned and unlearned, this side of the Apostles' Commission has remained to this hour without effect. The Reformation, a great and blessed work of God as it was, for which we cannot be too grateful, while it brought once more into light much of the unsearchable riches of Christ that had become encrusted with the corrosions of popish error, left this side of the truth holy in darkness, and it was reserved in God's inscrutable wisdom to a later day and to a feeble folk to exhume from the word the long buried treasure. <laughs> Now, aside from the little things he says there about himself and his, and his fellow brethren, he's saying that the, that the Reformation uncovered some things about justification, but this entire part of it, the entire, this entire understanding of Paul, the Reformation said what? Nothing, Nothing about it. Okay? Now, let's look at the next paragraph. It is, no, it is no disparagement of the Reformation to say that it brought back only a part of the long-lost truths of the Word, it was pure sovereign grace that led men so far into truth as they did go, as it is pure sovereign grace that has, in these latter times, through other instrumentality, directed the minds of numbers of God's children to other truths in the Word not then discerned. So, does he view, <coughs> does he view this as advancing and building on what the Reformers sort of understood? Okay, next, next bullet point. Holden's work includes a lengthy discussion of the Greek word oikonomia, 
which he defines as house law. That's the Greek word for dispensation. I.e. the laws, rules, regulation, or administration of a household. After surveying all the passages in which oikonomia and its sister word, oikonomos, appear, Holden offers the following definition of dispensational truth. It looks at the world as a great household or stewardry, in which God is dispensing or administering according to, his, uh, to rule of his own establishment, and in whose order he has from time to time introduced certain changes, the understanding of which is consequently needful, both to the intelligent interpretation of his word and to intelligent action under him. Now I'm to stop there. Do Sadler and Stam know what they're talking about when they say that Schofield uncovered the dispensational method? No. What has he just said there? He says that you got to understand that God is a dispensational God. That the house of God has been operated under different instructions and they've changed from time to time throughout the outworking of God's plan. Picking it up now, Holden illustrates this point by comparing the household of a godly man with that of a godless man in which two female servants trade places. In order to her becoming a faithful and profitable servant in the godly household, she must first acquaint herself with its order or economy and then conform herself to it. Even a change in the circumstances of the same household will necessitate sometimes a change in its rule and demand, therefore, a corresponding change in the conduct of its servants. Based upon these premises, Holden concludes that God is a dispensationalist and that the only prayer mankind has to understand scriptures is to rightly divide the word of truth. Now look at the next paragraph, okay? Now surely it is just as plain, just as simple and plain, that if God has from time to time introduced changes into the order of his dealings with the world and dispensing its affairs, the nature of these changes must be studied, understood, and acted on by his servants if they would prove profitable servants and cooperate intelligently in his plans. To import into one dispensation the directions or conduct prescribed for another must entail confusion and disorder whether in the interpretation of the scripture relating to them or in the regulation of action, individual or corporate under them. Now look at the bold statement. Hence, the necessity of what the apostle, 2 Timothy 2.15, calls rightly dividing the word of truth. The neglect of which has ever been and ever must be the source of unutterable confusion. In short, of most of the confusion we see around. What did he just say? He nailed it. What did he just say? Huh. He just said the reason there's so much confusion in Christendom is because they haven't done what? Right. They haven't rightly divided the word of truth. It may as well have been written by Sam or Sam. Okay? Or O'Hare. All the problem, the problem with biblical interpretation according to Holden is that man hasn't recognized 2 Timothy 2.15 and hasn't done what? Rightly divided the word of truth. Speaking about the dispensation of the law, Holden wrote, the dispensation, that dispensation closes at the cross. Now that's debatable, obviously. And subsequently, a thorough and universal change was introduced, constituting the dispensation under which we are now, we now are, called in this passage the dispensation of the mystery, and in verse 2, the dispensation of the grace of God. Just as Moses was the divinely appointed instructor during the dispensation of the law, Paul is a divinely appointed instructor for the current dispensation of grace, according to Holden. Holden goes on to plainly state that the reason there is so much confusion in Christendom is because of the general ignorance of the mystery. To make all men see what is the dispensation, or in other words, to be the divinely appointed instructor in the character and order of the present time. As Moses was in the dispensation of the law, is the special feature in the commission of Paul in which, in which it was distinct from that of the other apostles. What did he just say? What, what did he just say? Paul he just a different message than the rest of them. Exactly. He's basically making the whole argument that Stan makes in Moses and Paul. If you, have, if you haven't read Moses and Paul, it's a little thin little booklet written by Stan 
where he talks about how Moses was the spokesman of God during the dispensation of the law, just as Paul is the spokesman of God during the dispensation of grace. Next paragraph. If then it shall appear that far from seeing what is the dispensation of the mystery, the mass of Christians have entirely missed it. And as the natural consequence, listen, have almost completely misunderstood Christianity. Importing into it things proper to another dispensation and so confounding Judaism and Christianity into an inexpressible jumble. Surely it's a matter of deep humiliation before God and for earnest prayerful effort to retrieve, with God's help, this important and neglected teaching. He just said that the problem is that all that people are lifting things from other dispensations because they haven't recognized Pauline authority and mixing it all together. And in mixing it all together, what they've done is they fundamentally misunderstood Christianity and created a Jewish Christian jumble and mess out of the Bible. And if anybody's really going to ever understand it, they're going to have to recognize that God gave this information to who? To Paul. Mike, did you have a question? Or not? That's exactly the... Um, J.C. O'Hare wrote a booklet called The Great Blunder of the Church, and that's exactly the same thing. And O'Hare never quotes Holden. So you got to wonder, were these men aware of this stuff? Part of me feels it would be, it's impo- it's, part of me feels it's impossible that they weren't. They had to be. But maybe they, maybe they, they were unaware of it. I don't know. It seems unlikely. Holden, moving on now, Holden is so explicitly clear about the connection between the words revelation and mystery in Ephesians 3. Let the reader then observe, first of all, that Paul claims to have had the truth in question given to him by what? Revelation. Now, the word revelation means unveiling or uncovering. And, it, and it's used in Scripture to signify that communion by God of truth not previously known, or up to that time shrouded under veil of secrecy. The fact, therefore, that the, that the Apostle claims for the truth he speaks of in this chapter, the character of a revelation, ought itself to prepare us for the discovery in his teachings, or teaching, of somewhat not met with any in previous portions of the Word of God. So what's he saying? He's saying, you can't find this anywhere else in the Word of God. Because it was given to Paul by what? By revelation. So that means that until the point it was given to Paul by revelation, it was under veil of secrecy. It was not revealed, it was not made known until it was given to who? To Paul. Next, be it observed that, that uh, next, be it observed, he calls it a mystery or secret, which secret he insists on with repetition and emphasis as entirely hidden till God, till given to him to tell out. Thus, in verse three and five, by revelation, by revelation of God made known to him the mystery which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed. And so, in verse nine, the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God. Language could hardly be more explicit than this: a secret which had not in other ages been made known to men, but from the beginning of the world had been hidden God, is now made known to the apostle by revelation. Folks, I don't know how you get any more clear than that. To other ages or generations, it was not made known from the age and the generations. It was it, it has been hidden from the ages and from the generations. It has been hidden, hid from the beginning of the world, hidden God, kept secret since the world began. If known, uh, if if known of no truth, I know. Sorry, of no truth in the whole range of the word to which the testimony is more explicitly and unmistakable. And I trust the reader will be prepared in view of it to set down as a, as a point of certainty that whatever the mystery may be, it is something quite unknown until the day of Paul. If the reader has, no, if the reader has now fully bowed to the word on this point, 
he will at once perceive that to look for an un look for an unfolding of this mystery in the pages of the Old Testament must be hopeless and deceptive and deceptive proceeding. For any man to imagine he finds there that which the Holy Ghost so expressly declares was was hidden an unrevealed secret when that book was written must be to follow his will of a wisp that will lure him into the quagmire of misinterpretation and confusion. Let the reader keep this point in memory. It will meet us again when we have advanced our inquiry another stage, examining next, in, uh, should say, into the subject of the mystery itself. And there definitely are two typos there. Look, folks, I can't, I can't make this stuff up. I will... I will, when I, I, am, I, will, I swear on the stack of King James Bibles that when Mike handed me this thing and I read it last summer, I'm laying on my floor reading it and I'm thinking, I cannot believe that I'm reading this. Because everything that I've been told and taught in my sort of edu ed ministerial education, if you want to put it that way, never would have told me that that should be in existence in 1870. And there it is. Okay. Hold and define the mystery as the church, the body of Christ, and argues that the essence of the mystery is encapsulated in the following three points. Number one, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs. Number two, that they should be one body. Number three, that they should be partakers or co-partners of God's promise in the Messiah. In other words, the church or assembly of God is distinguished alike from the Jewish assembly and from the kingdom. So, according to Holden, is the church the same as the kingdom? No. Is the church the same as Israel? No. no. For this thing, the church of God, or for any other of these three features of which distinguish it most markedly, as well, as well from all that has gone before, as from all that will follow after, the reader will search in vain throughout the pages of the Old Testament. This, then, is the mystery, the church of God. So, what does he say the mystery is? The church, the, church, the body of Christ. Holden also demonstrates an astute awareness of the word church. Anticipating possible objections, Holden writes that the church spoken of by Paul is not the same church Stephen spoke of in Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Holden comments on this on this matter. Holden's comments on this matter sound like one of the main arguments utilized by Bernay Schutz in his book Three Bible Churches. But and now quoting Holden, but the reader may say, surely the church is spoken of in the Old Testament. Does not Stephen affirm it in Acts seven thirty five when he speaks of the church in the wilderness? Stephen uses the word church and applies it to Israel as found in the wilderness is beyond question. Just as certain as the Holy Ghost employs it in Acts, four, in Acts 19.41 and applies it to an idolatrous rabble gathered in the theater of Ephesus, of whom after they had spent two hours in shouting, Great is Diana of the Ephesians, it is said he dismissed the church. The employment of the word church or ecclesia in these cases no more implies that one assemblage, one assemblage was the church of God than the other. How many, how many, Norm, you probably were, maybe Mike, some of you may have read about three Bible churches by Vernon Schultz. Yeah. That's basically the argument. He talks about the church in the wilderness, the Jewish church that starts in Acts 2, and then the, 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 the body of Christ that starts with Paul. And there's, there's Holden, in 1870, basically articulating the main argument of Schultz's book. Regarding the first key point of the mystery, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, is nowhere found in the Old Testament, Holden writes... The broad statement in this, as in other points, is that of Gentile equality with the Jew. And such is the highest position of the Gentile in the prophets of the Old Testament. He is to share in the benefits of Israel's inherited blessing. But is never lifted in the position of a co-heir, never made Israel's peer. So he says that in the Old Testament, Israel, the Gentiles are going to be blessed, but they're going to be blessed through who? 
Israel, and never are the Gentiles put on the same standing and footing in the Old Testament as they are with who? As Israel is. After a lengthy explanation, this is my comment there in parentheses, after a lengthy explanation of Isaiah chapter 60, verses 3 through 16, Holden concludes, but still it is Zion, or Israel, that they are spoken And the Gentile is there exhibited as coming to her light to be blessed. And finding his blessing and ministering to her as might happen where the servant of a master who was come into a rich rich estate might share in the benefit of his master's improved circumstances, though though not himself a co-heir with him in his inheritance. Israel is to inherit the Gentiles... But the Gentiles not, uh, the, but the Gentile is not to inherit who? Israel. Israel. So he does he understand how Gentile blessing in the Old Testament works? I'm telling you, I, I, maybe, maybe this isn't exciting information to you, but this this is amazing stuff. Without specific, listen to this one. Without specifically using the phrase "time past," Holden contrasts Paul's comments about Israel being one body with the Gentiles with numerous passages from the Old Testament prophets, where God clearly distinguished between these two groups of people. God's reconciling both on Himself in one body is the second part of the mystery, according to Holden. Did my reader ever detect in the course of, of, the, of this study of Moses and the prophets anything that looked like this? Most surely not. If there is one if there is one thing more evident than another in the, in the Hebrew Scripture, it is the steadily maintained distinction between Israel and the nations. From the first to the last, under the goal, under, sorry, under the glory of the future, as under the vicissitudes of the past. The wielding of Israel and the nations into the welding, sorry, of Israel and the nations into one body, form with their uh, Form with their nationality shall disappear, all distinctive autonomies be lost, is a thought as foreign to the ancient oracles as heaven is to earth. Take any of the scriptures that refer to Messiah's reign and blessing that are to be that, that are that blessing that are to attend to it, the nations and Israel will, will ever be found in separation. After using Psalm 72, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Zechariah 14, as examples, Holden states, Everywhere it is the same. Israel and the nations in their respective places, in most telling contrast with what the Apostle insists on as a distinctive of the present order of things. Where in Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. He says one of the fundamental issues here of the mystery of the church is this issue of Jew, Gentile, what? Equality. You can't read about it in the Old Testament. You can't demonstrate it everywhere, not only there, but also in the prophecies about their future inheritance. There's always a separation between them, and the nations are always being blessed through Israel, and they are never made co heirs together with Israel. Yeah. Can I show you a scripture in the wisdom writings that I think, I'm sure no, that Solomon when he wrote this had, didn't have a clue. But look up Proverbs 17 verse 2. Proverbs 17, verse 2. A wise servant shall have rule over a son that causeth shame, and shall have part of the inheritance among the brethren. So what do you... I just think that that God was hinting at his secret in such a way that nobody could ever catch on, but that, you know, that that's just the way it might go among people. Um, I, I, just, I just think it's cool. I would not, for me personally, I would not say that that's tipping no, it like, no, the mystery. Would catch on by but, but no, if I see what you're saying, 
that looking back, uh, uh, the wisdom writer recognizes that this could happen in a household of, of people. And he's certainly only talking about, he's, you know, how right. things go on earth. But I, I just think it's cool that it, that, you know, it might be, now that, now that it's been revealed, you might be able to see that, you know, God was chuckling a little when he, when he had signs like that. Certainly this could happen in, in an earthly household, something of this nature. Yes. How many, how many pages we got left? Thank you. Oh, man. All right. <laughs> Halfway down page six. Regarding the third aspect of the mystery, that the Gentiles are co partners in God's promise of the Messiah, Holden wrote If there is one thing that excites the ire of the Jew, it is the claim of the Gentile to an equal share with himself in the Messiah. He laughs to scorn the Gentile pretension to show from the prophets that such a thing should be. And he does so triumphantly, it is not there. And to pretend that it is, is to weaken under pretense of strengthening the Christian cause. God has said it is not there. To profess to find it is to pervert his truth. And must lead to confusion of him who attempts it. Intimations of Israel's future and their rejection there are. Predictions of blessing to the Gentiles under Israel. And in connection with the Messiah, abound. As in the scriptures, they have already been before us. But a co-partnership, anything like the equality of privilege in the Messiah that the gospel has introduced, as we ourselves at this moment enjoy, will be sought in vain. If the mystery of the church of God is not found in the Old Testament, that what, then what was found therein? According to Holden, the Old Testament is taken up with the subject of the establishment of the kingdom. But if there is indeed no mention of the mystery, the church of God in the Old Testament scriptures, of what then is there mentioned? I answer the kingdom. A reign of righteousness and peace under the kingship of the Messiah. Zion, the seat of rule. Israel, a people of particular nearness and special privilege with the nations. Ground around this center. In their subordinate places, blessed in Israel's blessing, in whom all the families of the earth are to be blessed. Such is the future depicted by the prophets, alluded to in the New Testament as the times of refreshing. Interesting. We're going to come back to this point in a little while, but he says that in Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, when Peter's talking about the times of refreshing, that is, he's offering them the fulfillment of their what? Prophecy. Prophecy. This and only this is the theme of the prophets of old. A state, a state of things which the present dispensation in no wise corresponds at almost any point. A state of things the world has not seen. Is that no wise or now wise? If you have now, is that a type error? Where? That last sentence. A state of things which the world has not seen. I think I fixed no, it. No, before that. Before that. He says the present dispensation. No, lies. no, okay. Just making sure yeah. it changes nice. it. So, <laughs> so next page. Have then the prophecies failed? Hold on. By no means. So certainly are these. So certainly are, as these are foretold, so surely will they one day come to pass. So writes Holden in a lengthy section where he discusses what happened to the kingdom. Holden understood that during the earthly ministry of, of Christ, Israel's long prophesied kingdom was announced as being at hand. And in Israel accepted her Messiah, the prophetic promises of the Old Testament would have been accomplished. In the following astounding section, Holden addresses how the revelation of the mystery took Satan by complete surprise to the undoing of his entire plan of evil. To Satan... For whom be born in mind, the counsels of God are as secret until revealed, as to the children of men, it must, it must have appeared a marvelous triumph of his ingenuity and devilish craft when he had succeeded to appearance in overthrowing the, plan, uh, the, the plans and giving the lie to the prophetic teaching of God by securing the rejection and crucifixion of God's king. The revelation of the mystery unfolded 
in vain before the eyes of God's children has been seen of him, Satan, with clever discernment. So he's saying, look, all these guys out here that have missed the revelation of the mystery, they may have missed it, but who gets it? Satan. Satan. Okay? Nor let the reader consider, this is a mere conjecture, it is the teaching of the word itself. And he quotes Ephesians 3, verses 9 through 10. Here we have the fact that the display of God's manifold wisdom by means of the church was a fore-contemplated object of creation, and that with express reference to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Now, if Ephesians 1 21 and Colossians uh, 1 or Colossians 2 10, principalities and powers seem employed to designate celestial inhabitants in favor with God, Ephesians 6 12. The same is used for the deadly enemies of God and man, the wicked spirits known elsewhere as the devil and his angels, by whom this manifold wisdom will be learned to, the, to their confusion and dismay, as by the others to their edification and joy, through the demonstration of God's ability to accomplish results, the highest and most blessed, through the instrumentality of of the very elements that seem most to thwart his plans and traverse his purposes. He says Satan had nothing. Satan was totally unaware of it until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul and realized that it was unre- that it was revealed to the complete undoing of his entire scheme and plan of evil. And that it's made known in the heavenly places by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Look at the next paragraph. No, Satan has not triumphed. God's purpose is not foregone. God's plans have suffered no frustration. A postponement, but a foreseen one, has delayed the immediate accomplishment of it. He's referring to the kingdom here. But in his seeming victory, the prince of darkness has outwitted himself, has wrought out God's secret purpose to suspend for a season the erection of his throne in order to prepare in order to the preparation of a bride for his king. You already know I do not think that the church is the bride of Christ, and we are getting to the point where I'm going to talk about that, just not yet. To be associated with him in his reign, the church of the living God, an otherwise unknown thing, a people brought in the special place of nearness, who owning and taking part with him in his humiliation and rejection, shall also have part in his exaltation and glory who because they suffer with Him, shall also reign with Him. Listen, filling that very place in the heavenlies, in which Satan and his angels now are, those powers of the air of which He is Prince, the wicked spirits in the heavenlies, against whom, as the opposers of her blessing, the church and their individual members, have has now the, the, the content, now has now to contend in spiritual conflict. No, the prophecy spoke only of the earth. There was in these no intimation of a people to fill the place of, of the satanic powers, no word of their being dispossessed in favor of a people redeemed from the earth. This was a secret, a mystery, hidden God, which Satan's seeming triumph gave occasion both to the unfolding and to the accomplishment of to his utter and eternal confusion, and to the display of God's manifold wisdom, his grace, his glory, and the kingdom, the kingdom which the saints thought to, which Satan thought to frustrate, will yet be set up on earth, the millennium of New Testament prophecy, the literal accomplishment of every detail of God's word, and the full vindication of the faithfulness of God and the truthfulness of his prophets. I read that and I ask myself, am I reading William Holden in 1870, or am I reading Keith Blades' Satan and his Plan of Evil? The present dispensation, then, listen, this is it's an, it's an interim or parenthetic period, contemplated indeed in the counsels of God, but not revealed till given to Paul as set forth as set forth. Once this truth is seen, it become the key to the interpretation of Scripture and, of, and to rightly dividing the word of truth. In the sundering of things Jewish from things Christian, until this is seen, neither testament can be understood aright, 
And Christianity, indeed, of having its proper and distinctive character, is degraded into a sort of bastard Judaism. Whoa. Read that from the pulpit of churches today. What's that? <laughs> Read that from the pulpit of churches today. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like page after page here. Okay, we still have ten minutes, so we're going to press on, all right? Sorry, we don't have time for more questions. But you've got to see all this stuff. Holden writes that instead of seeing Christianity as something taught exclusively by Paul, the church has viewed Christianity as the flowering bud of Judaism and has blended things Jewish with things Christian, resulting in an entire misunderstanding of the Christian dispensation. Quoting Holden again, but they did not see what, what, it, what is the, fellow, the dispensation of the mystery, and because they did not, they have, they have also left us in their chapter headings a moment of uh, inevitable consequences of ignorance of this cardinal truth. So he's, he's blasting the reformers for the chapter headings in their Protestant Bibles. In common with all the, uh, with all the divines of their day, they took up the erroneous notion of Christianity instead of being, as taught by Paul, a distinct thing and a previously unrevealed secret, was was but the foretold outcome of the regular and anticipated development of what had proceeded, the full-blown flowering from the bud of Judaism. Of the, of the parenthetic or integral character of the dispensation, they had not a concept that the church of God was a thing so distinct and particular in respect of all that had gone before, and and. Uh, as to be quite unknown to prophecy, was a thought to which they were wholly strangers, a thought so foreign to their minds that taking for granted that Christianity and the church must be, must be there, they turned the Old Testament scriptures with the deliberate purpose therein to discover it. So he's saying they, they went in the Old Testament and they went and read it into the Old Testament on purpose. The natural result, the natural result of a research for what was not under the control of a foregone conclusion that it was, is easy to anticipate. They must of necessity misapply to it what belonged to something else, and accordingly the prophetic announcements concerning Israel and the kingdom are made to do duty on behalf of the church with the necessary consequence in their, in, uh, in their own and all minds that have followed in their wake of an entire misunderstanding of the Christian dispensation, no less than of the millennial dispensation, yet to follow, a blending of things Jewish with things Christian, to the, listen, to the lowering of the entire character of the heavenly calling, and a misapplication throughout of the truth of God. I, see, I don't, even, I don't know if I can preach a better sermon than what this guy's writing. Holden even understood that the revelation of the mystery filled up and completed the Word of God. If all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hid in the mystery, so that the dispensation of it is given to Paul is the filling up or completing of the Word of God, as stated in Colossians now, 125, of the previous chapter, then it is self-evident that where the mystery is not understood, the key to understanding the Word is not at hand. And that the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, though fully revealed, must remain locked. 1870. Holden says Israel's hope was to be with God in the wilderness, in the land, and ultimately in the kingdom. In contrast, the hope of glory for the body of Christ is Christ in His people. The hope of the church is the hope of glory, quoting Holden now. Israel's hope in the wilderness was the hope of the land. Their hope in the future is still the land under the kingdom in the millennial blessedness. If there is a glory connected with it, as there certainly is, it is still earthly glory, glory in the earth. The church's glory, on the contrary, is celestial glory. The glory of God and of Christ. The glory which thou hast given me, I have given them. He's quoting verses here. Uh, I will that they also, which, which thou hast given me, uh, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. Israel's hope of promised blessing rested on the presence of Jehovah with them in the pillar, in the, in the pillar of 
pillar of cloud and of fire. Jehovah with and among them is a symbolic presence. Was thus the glory of God's, uh, the glory of Israel's position in the midst of the nations of the earth and the guarantee of which their hope, the promised inheritance, responded. The riches or wealth of the glory of the mystery, notice, is Christ in his what? See, he makes a distinction between Christ, God being with Israel, and him being made manifest in us. And he says that God being with Israel is the hope of Israel. Him being made manifest in us, that's the hope of the body of Christ, he says. Great as Israel's privilege in having Jehovah so nigh unto them as never to any other people or nation, their pledge of the land flowing with milk and honey, the glory is eclipsed by the overflowing abundance, the wealth of glory pertaining to the pilgrim church of God and the dispensation of the mystery, which glory, listen, is personal Union with a risen, exalted, and divine head as members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. A union which is to them the unfailing guarantee and basis of that hope of glory which is set before them as the goal toward which they journey onward. Well may the apostle term this a wealth of glory, a glory veiled indeed from carnal and unbelieving eyes, so that the world knew, knoweth it not because it knew him not, but now real, and how unspeakably precious to him, to whose faith and experience it is known, well might he in comparison of Israel's glory. Now look, I'm, for the sake of time, I'm going to have to stop and skip ahead. But if you look at the last point on this page, Holden like Trotter before him understood much about the nature of the dispensation of the fullness of times. Holden viewed this dispensation as the heavenly side of the mystery. The truth of the dispensation of the fullness of time was not another mystery, but another phase or more advanced stage in the same great secret, according to Holden. Now I'll let you read that stuff on your own about the, the dispensation of the fullness of time. Go to the next page, because I want to get to the concluding remarks. I think you've seen enough to get the point. Holden even seems to have understood some things about the unity of the Spirit and the one baptism of Ephesians 4 as being spiritual in nature. He explicitly mentions how the body is being formed by one Spirit, through whom all believers are baptized into one body. Therefore, the unity of the body is derived from the fact that it has been tempered together by Christ. Now, this is important. I do want to read this. If God has revealed to us, quoting Holden now, if God has revealed to us the order and plan of the dispensation in which he has set us, set us that Christ should by his death not only save our souls, but should gather together into one the children of God that were scattered abroad, so that there should be one flock and one shepherd. Now, look, some of these, he's still inconsistent in some of the verses he's using. And you do have to be aware of that. That in reconciling men to himself by the cross... From among Jews and Gentiles, it, 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 was, it was His will that this should be effected, not as scattered units as in former ages, but that those so reconciled should be found in unity in one body, and that this body of His own divine purpose has been formed by the one what? Spirit. Spirit. By whom we are all what? Baptized, Baptized into it. That he had tempered us, that he had tempered the body together, and has set members, every one of them in the body, as it had pleased him, in order that the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, should make increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And that, and that for this reason he will, that there should be no schism in the body. Now, I just want to point out to you that, that is that explicitly clear that he's saying that there is no water baptism? Does he say that? He does not say explicitly that there is no water baptism, but he understood it stands that the one body is formed by the one spirit, and that the one spirit baptizes you into the one body, and he understands that, that at least that aspect, aspect of it is what? Spiritual. Now, for the sake of time, I want you to go to the concluding remarks. Sorry we don't have more time to discuss this stuff, but 
concluding remarks. Now these are my observations. The depth of understanding Holden displays is mind-boggling. Reading Holden is like reading J.C. O'Hare, C.R. Stammer, Charles F. Baker 60 to 70 years before anyone is supposed to have understood these doctrines according to the standard historical understanding we have functioned under. Richard Holden was a mid-Acts dispensationalist 60 to 70 years before the descriptor came into usage. He articulates all the core principles of a mid-Acts position. First, he never says that the church started in Acts 2. Trotter said that, and so did Darby. Holden never says that. Okay? Second, Holden defines the mystery as the church of God. Third, he describes the church of God as a unique situation in which Jews and Gentiles have been, number one, made fellow heirs, Number two, been made one body. And number three, been made partakers of God's promise in Christ by the gospel. Fourth, this mystery, i.e., God's plan for forming the church the body of Christ, was kept secret since the world began. It was therefore unknown prior to the time of Paul. Therefore, the church could not be formed until the mystery was revealed to the apostle Paul, according to Holden. Fifth, Holman states that in the coming of the Messiah there was a real and perfectly consistent offer to Israel of the long prophesied kingdom. An offer which had, which had it been accepted would have led to the immediate accomplishment of the promise, promises and the introduction of his glorious reign. This offer of the kingdom is extended into the Acts period beyond Acts 2. In the following statement, Holden views the fundamental distinction of time past between Israel and the Gentiles as still being in force in Acts 3. A reign of righteousness, quoting Holden now, a reign of righteousness and peace under the kingship of the Messiah, Zion, the seat of rule, Israel, a people of particular nearness and special privilege, with the nations grouped around its center in the subordinate places, blessed in Israel's blessing, in whom all... All the families of the earth are to be blessed. Such is the future depicted by the prophets alluded to in the New Testament. Then he quotes Acts chapter 3, verse 19 through 21, as the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, the times of restitution of all things. This only is the theme of the prophets of old, a state of things which must, uh, a state of things which the present dispensation in no wise corresponds. So look at it. He never says that the church starts when? Acts 2. And he clearly says, I just read it to you, that in Acts 3, the kingdom is still being offered to who? And, he's, and he defines the mystery as the church of God. So if he says if he never says it started in Acts 2, and he's still saying in Acts 3 that the kingdom's being offered to Israel contingent on their repentance, and he understands that the mystery is... Uh, relates to the body of Christ, and that that isn't made known until it's revealed to who? Now you tell me what he is. He's not an Acts 2 dispensationalist. Or at least not the way he's explaining himself here, he's not. Now let's go on. Therefore the current dispensation cannot have been in Acts 2. Six, Holden does not extend the dispensational boundary to Acts 28.28. Nor does he differentiate between the Acts and the post-Acts epistles of Paul. Instead, as the following quote testifies, Holden viewed the revelation of the mystery originating with Paul and encompassing the entire Pauline era. Quote, that whatever the mystery may be, it is something quite unknown until the day of who? Now, he's already defined the mystery here as being what? The body, the, body, the church. And he said it was unknown until the day of Paul. So was it, made, was, was it started back here? But he includes the entire day of Paul in with that revelation. The present dispensation is in an interim, a prophetic period, completed Contemplated, sorry, indeed in the counsel of God, but not revealed till given to who? Michael Penny, author of Approaching the Bible, states the following regarding Holden's view of the mystery and the place of the Pauline epistles. Instead of limiting the revelation of this mystery 
and the start of, the, of this dispensation until after Acts 28.28, 28, and the giving of Ephesians, Holden widens it to embrace Paul's day. That is, all Paul's letters are seen to be directly for this one. Okay, folks, so let's see what we got here. He never says it started where? Acts 2. Acts 3, he's still saying it's an offer of the kingdom to Israel contingent on their repentance. He says that it includes the entire day of Paul, and he never goes all the way out here to say it starts in Acts 28, 28. And it says that it encompasses the entire day of Paul, all of his epistles. So if he if he's, doesn't start it in Acts 2, and he doesn't start it here, then what is he? He's mid -X. Now, did he call himself mid -X? No. no. But is he mid yeah. I would say he is based on this. Conclusion and we'll quit. What would you call somebody who held the following dispensational positions? Does not teach implicitly or explicitly that the church began in Acts 2. Viewed the kingdom as still being offered to Israel in Acts 3. Did not start the dispensation of grace in Acts 28 or differentiate between the Acts and post-Acts epistles. Defined the mystery as the revelation of the church, the body of Christ. Taught that the mystery was not revealed until it was given to Paul and that it included the entire day of Paul. Taught that the body of Christ will one day occupy the positions of governmental authority in the heavenly places currently occupied by principalities and powers with whom they currently wrestle. Knew that the church was not spiritual Israel but an entirely separate and distinct entity. Taught that the revelation of the mystery fulfilled and completed the word of God. Understood that the hope of glory for the church was Christ being formed in the believer. <coughs> Saw the dispensation of the fullness of times as a yet future dispensation in which all things in heaven and earth centered in Jesus Christ. Understood the unity of the Spirit contained only one baptism and that believers were placed into one body by the spiritual baptism of the one Spirit. And taught that God was a dispensationalist. And the source of all the confusion in Christendom stemmed from a failure to rightly divide the word truth. In bold at the bottom, I would call such a person a mid ax dispensationalist. Richard Holden was a mid ax dispensationalist 60 to 70 years before there was a formal classification for the beliefs he articulated. Now look, I'm not aware of anything else this man wrote. It has not come to my attention. I have not, I've looked for other things. I have not found anything. It's highly possible there are other things out there that are anonymous and so on. But based on this document and the teaching that he puts forth in this document, I am comfortable saying that the, that the fundamental ingredients of what we believe were known and in print by the year 1870. Okay? But we really have to go because it's 10 after. So, sorry we don't have more time for questions. Hopefully we may next time. Thanks for your attention.